this uh, good morning. Joshua will start his class, okay? Okay, good morning, everyone. Obviously, I'm back here on a Monday morning, nine o'clock there. And this will be a new section on epidemics. And I'm going to be giving back-to-back -back lectures this morning. And Flavia, I believe this first one is from 9 to 10.30, and then you have 11 to 12.30. That's correct? That's correct. Right, great. And the theme of, of this next few days will be epidemics. Can you just raise your hand? Did you do some of the mathematical models of epidemics with uh, Krenkel? Uh, you've already seen some. Okay, fine. So that's good. This will hopefully reinforce and we'll see how long this one goes and where I bridge between this lecture and the next lecture. Um, but we've done a lot of work at the interface of fundamental principles of epidemic dynamics and also trying to respond rapidly to an emerging infectious disease. And maybe the spirit of this week's lectures is encapsulated by this image. Uh, this is a collaboration between an artist at Georgia Tech, Mary Wang, and Stephen Beckett, who's in the room with you, who had worked on a few years of what is called Science, Art, and Wonder, an interface program at Georgia Tech meant to uh, partner up artists, sometimes at Tech, sometimes outside, with scientists in the community. And I think what you can see here are some of the issues at stake as we thought about risk locally across the United States and some of what we were trying to make a difference in people's lives and local communities at different points of time. So let's see if I can advance the slides. So today I'll talk about pandemic models and mitigation. How do we translate epidemic principles into practice? And I will not in some ways just start with the mathematical models and explain to you how they work, but rather try to put them in some context today and not always explain all the details. And then I will use the second part of my lecture to go into some of those details. So first motivating you by how they're actually, how these models face the real world when they work or how they can be a guide and how often they fail. Uh, and then later in the week, you're gonna get a chance with Stephen to actually do some of these model developments yourself and going beyond some of what I can do in, in the lectures today. Okay, and before I even go into that, I have to make sure again, to just thank all the folks who, who supported the work and for the COVID work, it's a very large group of folks. Everyone who's lifted on the right somehow contributed to one of the projects that we've done on COVID, whether it's a communications project, a science project, an application project. And it just really did take a large interdisciplinary group to make any of this happen. So as some context, I just want to point out that when we do this class here, we have problem sets at the end of every week and at the end of every module. And I can't see how big the screen is relative to where you are in the room. Can folks at least read this? I'm not gonna read it all out loud. Can you kind of nod if you can read it? I, I assume, yes. So this was a problem set from the course that I developed in 2019, right? Fall 2019, before the outbreak in Wuhan. And I just want to point out one of the, the core idea in this model, we had been working on issues of awareness, behavior, and infectious disease in the group. And in this homework example, we built an, what I will explain soon is an SEIR model. And hopefully you can see my mouse, this susceptible exposed infectious recovered model in which we compartmentalize individuals and I'll explain how. But the key point is that this model was meant to be something like an airborne transmitted disease. Notice I use the word airborne like SARS. And this is a small city. And the idea is to predict the outbreak. But then I mentioned that people start to wear masks, which reduce the spread to nearly zero. But compliance is not perfect. And what would you do? And how would you design public health policy around mask wearing? I forgot that I had, because there's so many things happening, I forgot even that I had assigned this homework until almost a year later when I was going back to the class in my notes. And it's a bit uncanny, but also to point out that in many ways, there were a lot of folks who knew quite a lot about these kinds of models, about this kind of situation to the point where one could develop a, a problem set, right? Based on what one might do. 
But the real world is obviously more complicated than that. And there were certain challenges about SARS-CoV-2 versus SARS-1 that led to it really becoming a global pandemic. So I want to move back in time here a little bit in order to set the stage and get you in the frame of mind for where we were when we began to be aware in early 2020 that there was this cluster of pneumonia cases in Wuhan. A few weeks after that, Wuhan was closed systematically, meaning people were no longer able to travel. But of course, many people already had traveled outwards well before then. And at least in the United States, and this is going to be a, a largely a United States-centered talk, because that's the area I know more about, le know less about the Brazilian situation, although in broad terms, yes. We had our first introduced case that was documented in late January 2020 uh, near the Seattle area. And obviously, by February 2020, there were case surges in northern Italy, Iran, and it was clear this was not going to be SARS-1. It was not going to be confined uh, although severely in a local area, but it was going to be a global pandemic. In very early February, we had already started to organize a coronavirus rapid response forum, including Trevor Bedford, who some of you may know is one of the very first people to be involved in sequencing efforts and, and communicating the risk of human to human transmission, looking at data on sequence information, recognizing that there were specific mutations once they did the sequences in individuals who had been infected that implicated that this was not from environment, multiple introductions, but rather it was truly a human to human transmission case. And we already had our first preprint out by late Jan, early Feb. So we were already working on this from the very start. And the other person in the audience, and, and you can see that the audience there is kind of like the audience where you are. Maybe the one difference, some of you were in masks. Back then we weren't wearing masks. I'm pretty confident there were no cases at Georgia Tech or in Atlanta, at least maybe at Georgia Tech, I should say that early. Um, but we had things like a buffet lunch afterwards and, and soon after none of those things were possible. Trevor Bedford spoke on viral evolution. The other individual was Phil San Angelo who's talking about vaccines and continues to work on delivery devices, drugs and vaccines for SARS-CoV-2 and other respiratory illnesses. Soon after that, at least in the US, we tried to communicate the risk that when people gathered in groups because of the potential for airborne and, and large transmission, and because of the all too frequent nature of asymptomatic infection and transmission, that without proper precautions of which none of which were being taken at the time, that these events and gatherings could catalyze the large scale distribution and spread of COVID, meaning they would turn into super spread events. This was in March 12th. The title here, scientists do the math to show how large events like March Madness, and many of you probably don't know what March Madness is. It's a college basketball game. And I know Brazil and, and Argentina and other South American countries are big in basketball. In the US, we have a big college basketball game and the biggest game is held in a stadium that has about 75,000 people in it. So about 75,000 people gather to watch this basketball game at the end. Uh, and many more, many thousands more will be there supporting the event. This was canceled a few days later. The NBA season was canceled and shutdowns began soon after that. In fact, within just a few days later, the CDC began to recommend anything above 50 or more people should be canceled. So really trying to cancel these large group gatherings. At the same time when all this was happening and there were rapid increases in cases and fatalities, this is in the US on the Y axis is in thousands. So you can see mid April on the order of thousands per day. Some of the models began to predict a rapid disappearance of COVID. This is one example. It's from perhaps the most influential in terms of the Trump administration at the time, and even now one of the most influential modeling groups uh, for global health in the United States. It made US predictions and really global predictions. And it's based at the University of Washington. It was funded by the Gates Foundation, received hundred, literally hundreds of millions of dollars to do the work. It has an economics angle as well as a health impacts angle. 
And they made this prediction in around mid-April that despite the fact that there were on the order of thousands of deaths per day by mid-April, that by early to mid-June, this was going to all come to an end. And there are a couple of features here. I haven't even told you what this model is, but I will in a second. There are a couple of features here that I wanted to point out that should be alarming. And were alarming even at the time. You'll notice this is the prior data on which the model is somehow fit. And this dashed line is somehow the projection. And the shaded region is the uncertainty. So I'll just throw it out there. Does anyone notice anything? Obviously, it turned out to be wrong. The question is, how much do we know in the moment that things and predictions about epidemics may be problematic or maybe we should have some confidence in? Is there anything about this model that you notice seems odd? And I don't know, Flavio or Steven, someone, I don't know if you can um, shout it out or how you're doing the mics today. Joshua, can you hear me? Yep. Well, the first thing I know, the first thing I noticed is that, is that uh, the error seems to decrease a lot in time, which is really weird, and it makes no sense to me. That seems weird. It made no sense to me, and it made no sense to a number of us uh, in the field. Where, if anything, the error on the next day. I mean, you'll notice. Yes, there can be increases day to day, but. COVID has an incubation period, then an infectious period, and then, unfortunately, for some, a period of severity where you end up in the hospital or worse. That takes time. So the next day is most likely to be similar to today. Whereas here, they somehow predict, somehow the confidence intervals are between just a few hundred or 7,000. This seems just impossible. Right? I think that's what you're intimating. Yeah. And the other features, you probably would have expected the error to be smaller for the next day, but then to grow in time. There are many different ways in which individuals might behave, and for there to be not only the projected value to be zero, but the errors to basically go to zero, that they have 100% confidence in this model over here seems impossible. And I'm sure that's the other part I think that you're implying seems weird. And there's a saying by Yogi Berra that predictions are hard, especially about the future. And so to have this much confidence about emerging infectious disease two months out seems odd. I'm going to unpack this a little bit as to what was going on, but it wasn't the only one. And some of you may have heard the name Michael Levitt, a Nobel Prize winning chemist who made similar kind of predictions. I'm sure in Brazil there were similar predictions made. In the U.S. there was another kind of prediction which was a cubic fit. And I've overlaid a series of these predict projections by the IHME. This is this Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. One of them here says it's done uh, by, uh, let's say, mid-June, which is I showed you, then mid-July and mid-August. And I think you should also point out that this is the actual data up to a point where predictions are being made. This actual is this oscillating signal, some of which has to do, a lot of this oscillating signal has to do with reporting and, and, and weekend gaps and so on, but the overall signal of one word average is just going up and got into a plateau. So they made their prediction here, IHME, in mid-April, predicting it would go away by early June. Sorry, that popped up. So it made the prediction here, and then because it was clearly wrong, the IHME just kept predicting confidently that it would all go away by mid-July or by mid-August. This cubic fit took this data and literally fit a polynomial of order three to the data and said, well, if I have a polynomial of order three and I fit this, this is going to go crash out. And their prediction was that within a few weeks, uh, COVID would go away. So there was a lot of problems with that curve. And this is one thing from, it's 2021, a year later. It didn't take us a year to recognize that there were a lot of problems with this curve. This is just one particular retrospective piece. But in the moment, all of these models, it turns out the ones that I'm showing now that were 
in some ways not principled, did something that was based on a principle from about 175 years ago, which I'll explain in a moment. And this was an observation that was, it was quite insightful at the time. And it's become known as Farr's Law. And Farr was interested in the outbreaks of smallpox in different communities and noticed by looking at records of mortality in England that there seemed to be a symmetric nature to this spread. And in quotes here, why do the five deaths become 10, 15, 20, 31, 58, 88 weekly? So going up and then progressively fall through the same measured steps. And this FARS law became a guide to say that when there were certain kinds of diseases that spread, there seemed to be a symmetric rise and fall. And so all of this work, as you see, a uh, rise, and any time it starts to dip, any kind of model that assumes symmetry would say, well, it's going to dip all the way down and go away. Right? And this is this notion of FARS law. It turned out that people then used FARS law in one of the most infamous cases, applied it to HIV AIDS. So in 1987, Bregman and Langmuir looked at the number of cases of HIV AIDS and the year of diagnosis. And you'll see it's going up, but you'll notice there's this slight inflection point. And if you believe that what diseases do is go up and go down, then this inflection point could be the sign that it's gonna go up and go away. And in this article, they predicted that by 1995, HIV AIDS would, would be done. Obviously that's not the case, right? The actual number of new diagnoses, it would be off the screen, right? 75,000, nearly four times higher than 1987. It didn't go down to zero. And, and, and obviously there's, many uh, life-saving drugs that are available, but we have not stopped or found a cure or have cases go down to zero for HIV AIDS. This was the most infamous or modern use of this FARS law. But this is what in essence the IHME model and even these kind of cubic models did. They assumed a functional form for the cumulative cases. And they use this sort of sigmoidal function modified, which is the ER function, a sort of error function. And there's no mechanistic principle to this at all. But the cumulative number of cases in any cumulative distribution for any probability, dis probability distribution, if you take the cumulative, it starts at zero and goes to one. So whomever, can you raise your hand, told me about the, the sort of weirdness this is why it was so weird. They took cases and figured that this, if I add this up to some cumulative, it's going to reach a plateau and therefore the incidence must go down to zero very quickly. And if you're fitting a function that must be bounded, then you're rapidly going to get into a zone where the incidence goes to zero and you're completely confident about that, even though you're completely wrong, okay? So this was some of the backdrop, and unfortunately, it was the backdrop in many countries in which these very optimistic, non-mechanistic views were put out there and sometimes used politically to create a narrative that then we had to fight and undo, where people are making predictions of disappearance a few months out, and then when that didn't happen, doing that again and again and again. So I'm going to try to tell you something a bit more mechanistic and realistic. Even though I'll use a, a not realistic model to do so, it will be the basis for building more realistic and relevant models by asking the question, how are epidemics supposed to unfold and Josh. must go up and down symmetrically? Let me just finish this thought and then I'll take a question. Unless I lost the feed. Did I lose the feed? You're good. Carry on, and then we'll have the question. OK, great. And then I'll talk about why COVID-19 has been so difficult to predict and control. So first, I'll give you the basis for epidemic spread, and then go into some of the details and why I think 
the key nature of why it's so hard, both to predict what's going to happen, but also control it, and then get into some of the instruments, some of the practical steps that I think it needs, that we need to do to prevent, also fight back against COVID, but prevent future pandemics. That's the framework for today. I think there was a question that was about to be asked. <laughs> Can I? Okay. Hi, Josh. Oh, this is hi. Hi, Joshua. Um, can you go back one slide? Like, yeah. Um, I guess the question I wanted to ask is like, it seems like the models that were made for COVID weren't that great. But at that time, we didn't know a lot of, about COVID. I wanted to ask if they would still, even though they were not great, like models aren't always great, could they be considered like sound science still, even if the models weren't great? And in that case, like, what does that mean about communicating science in times of crisis, because if that was kind of sci sound science, even though it turned out not to be great, yeah. then it was correct, but not really. Like, I, I guess you could, you, you did understand, I wish. I, I okay. understand your question. So you can be wrong for the right reasons, meaning we could have built a model and there was still some uncertainty. It's the best we did at that point. And if so, we can communicate our uncertainty and maybe part of what we're doing. I don't think anyone, for example, would say that a weather report should be expected to predict the weather three weeks out within a few degrees at a certain time of day. And epidemic forecasting models were not at that level of prediction either, though they did get a lot better. But actually, I don't view this as sound science. And that's one of the points I'm trying to make, that there were alternatives that were being communicated in different places. And I don't know how much Stephen will talk about some of the spatial work he did, but in Georgia, for example, early on in 2020, and we're a state of 10 million people, you, know, you could think of a country the size of Switzerland, not as big as Brazil, obviously, by any means. And we made predictions within the state that said we could likely be in a plateau. And I tried to communicate that on public radio and in op-eds. And, and with Stephen, we talked about some of these issues early on. So there were notions that there were other alternatives and that those alternatives depended on what we did. And I'll get into it in this talk. Within high-profile models, and I think I can do something here. Um, I can't erase William Farr, but there were models that did something like this. And then others that did something like this. And it looks like I'm saying the same thing, but I'm not. What I'm trying to say is this is business as usual. And this is with some sort of lockdown or social distancing. And I will work on getting these pens better because otherwise this afternoon or this, this late morning lecture will be really hard. And this would be spring 2020. And this one would might be fall or even winter 2020. And so other models said that if we were to take steps, it wasn't like this was all going to go away, but that we could delay some of what was happening right? and buy time for other things, ba basically for us to do a better job at prevention, maybe even give us time for vaccines or, or responses. And vaccines were in fact already being started to be developed then, right, by February. Jan, Feb, people already had identified the spike protein. We're already making efforts uh, pretty much were sure they knew what it is they had to do to build the vaccine and then scale up. So there was sound science available. This was not. So it's actually quite hard. There's a book called Calling Bullshit uh, 
which I'm allowed to say because it's the title of a book, about how hard it is and there's an asymmetry because it's very easy to generate bullshit, but much harder to, to explain why it is BS. And the notion of BS is that it spreads more rapidly. So this idea that this was all going to go away was a very nice and appealing idea. To say that, in fact, this could be a plateau, it would be a long period, we had a long fight ahead of us, was a harder idea. And also at the time, we knew that there was uncertainty. And telling people we're not quite certain, oh, you're not certain, but that over there is certain. So I, to answer your question in brief, no, this was not the soundest science available. There was no basis to think any of this should apply for reasons I'll explain. And we knew that at the time, at the time. So what I will try to tell you in my own slice, no one scientist can tackle this whole thing, but in my own slice of what it is that we think we understood, we collectively, and how we locally tried to respond. And the response is not just about making forecasts, which is another point of what I'll try to do today. Models are not just about predicting the future and being right or wrong. They're also about explaining the rationale for action taking of different kinds. So that will be more of what I will get at today. And I think that goal is realizable. Does that help to answer your question? Yes, Joshua. Just an additional question, and you can answer it quickly. But would a model like that one that you said is not sound science uh, be accepted and published at, like, good journals so so that is i mean that's a different question during the pandemic publication became a second priority if these if the ihme were able and a lot of what we did stop being something that one worries about publishing but in fact you make a website and then you reach through reports really more like daily reports situation reports this group can reach millions upon millions upon of people tens if not hundreds of millions of people. And so it becomes a bit irrelevant about the goal of publication. When you're in a public health emergency, yes, some of it could end up later on, and some models did get into high-profile journals. They were simplistic, but the stuff that actually reached more people were those models that were able to take in data on a daily basis and then return predictions regularly. And they became a different sort of parallel track. And there were good things in both tracks. OK? But I think in responses, it's not our metrics can't just be publications. If we want to make impact and we want to communicate sound science, these, this article or the IHME work wasn't necessarily published, but it was making an impact. So the question was, it making a good impact? OK? OK, Joshua, thanks. Okay, I'm not going to speed up today. I mean, there are things I want to get through, but I want to, if this has three parts and I have two lectures and I have a few mathematical things I want to do, but because you've raised your hands already, I assume that you've seen some of the math things I was going to do, but some I'm sure you haven't. Uh, so let me just go through these sections and wherever I, I take a break, we take a break and then I'll come back, finish this and, and, and do the, the mathy components. So we'll see how it goes. So again, I'm going to go through three parts today. How are epidemics supposed to unfold? Why is COVID-19 so difficult to predict and control? And I, I think you're already seeing the hint of that, that people who feel fine can nonetheless transmit. And what does it take to build these tools in the moment, these instruments to prevent, you know, to mitigate against current, but also prevent future pandemics? And let's see. Okay, good. I have the clicker. And now my laser pointer looks better. So again, this is a talk on SARS-CoV-2 and responses. It would be different if we're talking about different kinds of diseases. So pathogens can be transmitted through vectors, through environmental contact, contact with contaminated surfaces or bodies of water, through touch, and also through airborne spread, whether through large droplets, which is sort of the flu model, or really particles that can maybe make it far more than six feet, but across a room 
through air ducts and, and, and at distances that are, are consistent with this notion of being in the air. And this is where we were with respect to some common cold, maybe measles and coronaviruses. Depending on what kind of situation it is that you're dealing with, you have to build models differently. Most of these models, though, start from an idea, as you can see here, that individuals are in different epidemic or disease states, I should say disease states. In this particular example, I'm using a color to denote that that individual is infectious, and there's some other individual who's susceptible. This is just one interaction at a time, but when you're building a model of the community as a whole, there are different ways to deal with that. It could be a non-spatial ODE-like model. I assume that's what you dealt with. With Was it Roberto who taught you that? Who, who taught you that? No one responded, but gave me, I assume it was Roberto Crankle. Is that right? Yep. That's right. Okay. In those kind of cases, you're going to take these individuals and divide them up and say what fraction of individuals in the community are of one kind or another. Or you could take the community and really work at the levels of individuals, but assume that anyone can interact with anyone. And in the laboratory side of what you're going to see in our class this week, you're going to do both of these. This might be a review to some extent, but I'm sure there'll be some new stuff. This, I assume, will be largely new. And one of the nice pieces, you're actually going to get to compare these two frameworks together and show they are different kinds of representations, but of really the same process. But of course, individuals are not all interacting with everyone. We, there, are structured, uh, there are structured aspects of all communities. There could be a household, there's business, there's work. And so you can imagine within different structures, people interact, relatively speaking, all with all but are preferentially interacting within one group and less so with some other group for all sorts of reasons. Depending on the question, the detail you want, you can include this level of resolution. And of course, you can fit data better the more you move to the right, but they're often harder to parameterize and analyze, especially for an emerging disease. So let's go through some of the basics. And this will be a review, but I have a particular take on some of these things, which I hope uh, includes surprises even from the start. This is what is called an SIR model, which I know you've seen before, susceptible infectious, in this case, recovered. It could also be removed. And we'll get in, unfortunately, the different ways in which individuals can be removed. As you can see here, we have different colors to note the different states. In this model, infectious individuals come in contact with susceptible individuals at some rate beta. Infectious individuals can recover over some time scale T sub I, and they get into this category. So contact between S and I lead to new I, I becomes R over some time scale T I. And one can translate, as I'm sure you've already seen, these equations, these, these interactions into the set of equations where the left-hand sides note the, the change of susceptibles, infectious and recovered individuals with respect to time, and there are two processes, infection and recovery. So you see that infection leads to a depletion of susceptibles with respect to the product of S and I, and I'll explain this in a moment. And that leads to an increase in infectious individuals and then over some characteristic time scale, so I over this TI, there is recovery, in which case we get an increase in recovered individuals. And the reason why this there's this product here and divided by N, you can imagine having an infectious individual which has a certain number of contacts, a certain fraction of which are with susceptible individuals. That's this S divided by N, a certain fraction of which lead to transmission. And that's why you get this beta I S over N, where beta, is going to be the product of the number of contacts and the probability that if it's with a susceptible individual, it would lead to a new infection. Okay. But there really aren't three variables here. 
depending on the time scale, and this can often be approximate, we often make the assumption that if we ignore demographic births and deaths, that the sum of S plus I plus R is some constant, therefore the derivative of D and DT is zero, which means of these three variables, we really only need two. And we often treat S and I, though of course you could treat I and R. And it turns out that if you take this kind of model and introduce a small number of infectious individuals in a community, in a population, it doesn't necessarily lead to an outbreak. These are two examples in which, starting with the same fraction of infectious individuals, you can see the infectious fraction goes down, and in another case, it goes up. And I have something here, this R0. So I've made a difference in my model in some way, which I'll explain in a moment, having to do with the number of new infections for infection, infected individual. And if that number, as you can see, one is greater than one, one is less than one, that we're going to get an increase or a decrease. And I'll explain what that means in just a moment. So we have a model in which you can have infectious individuals, but just because there's a seed event doesn't mean that diseases inevitably lead to an outbreak. They could decline rapidly over time. When there is an outbreak, you end up getting this kind of dynamics, right? in which the number of infectious individuals goes up and peaks and then goes down. The number of susceptible individuals goes down and plateaus. And I should point out, it doesn't plateau at zero, that there is a fraction of the population which is not infected throughout the epidemic, and that is a generic feature of these models. And then you have this increase of the recovered individuals. So by the end, there's no one infectious and the sum of these two is one, right? So we've transformed the susceptible people into recovered individuals. Okay, so why is it that sometimes these spread and sometimes they don't? At the beginning, if I were to take DIDT beta I S over N, minus I over TI, near the start, you can make the approximation that nearly everyone is susceptible. So this S is approximately N, which means that you have beta I minus I over TI, which means you can pull the I out of the equation, divide everything by TI, and you get that the rate of change of infectious individuals is proportional to I, times some constant. As you can see here, this constant is the product of the infectious rate beta times the period of infectiousness, Ti, minus one. Therefore, when this number is greater than one, then this prefactor is positive. And if it's positive, we have Di dt is i times some number. And what does that do? That's an exponential growth. When the product of this is less than one, then that minus one is a negative number with exponential decay. This box term in red is R naught, the basic reproduction number. It is literally defined as the infection rate times the duration of infectiousness in this simple model. More complex models takes a bit more to do, but it has that same spirit. It means the number of new infections expected due to a single infectious individual and otherwise susceptible population. Okay. I want to point out, though, there's lots of neat pieces here. If I expand the box, the difference between this first number, which is beta, minus the other number, gamma, which is just defined as 1 over Ti, is the difference between the infection rate and the recovery rate. And that's the speed. That's that prefactor. If R0 is greater than 1, the speed is positive. Otherwise, it's negative, which means we're going to have a decline. The bigger R0 is, right, then, although it's modulated by TI, all things being equal, the disease will take off at a faster speed. So you can see we have some relationship potentially between the strength and the speed. And finally, the last piece that mediates this relationship is this average period of infectiousness, which underlies something called the generation annuity. 
the period, the average period, which is the mean of this distribution, but it's truly a distribution between when the infector is infected and they infect other individuals. In this case, it's a exponentially distributed generation interval distribution whose mean is this T on. So we have strength, speed, and something about timing that relates the two. I assume you heard about R0 and you heard about the speed. So you're all well prepared for the next slide. Any questions about this before I move on? Okay, I don't see any. So let me go and do the example. Here's a synthetic example that I built in which we have some outbreak. This is I of T. So we have the prevalence, the number of infectious individuals at any given time, and it's taking off exponentially. And over a period of what looks like, you know, five to six months or so with an R naught of 1.5. And I put some noise there to denote the fact that there's some stochasticity involved, whether because of actual transmission stochasticity or because of counting. And then I did another synthetic example with R0 as two, and a third where R0 was 2.5. Did anyone notice something unusual here? Maybe someone I haven't heard from yet today. Um, maybe the beginning looks pretty much the same. Yeah, pretty much the same. Say almost exactly the same. Does that seem like I've made a mistake? Is this what you expect to see for diseases with different R naughts? I mean, typically people have been told, I don't know what you were told, that R naught means the disease is worse. So shouldn't it take off faster? Is anyone surprised here or do you all know this? Can't tell where, how's our mood this morning? I know Carnival was was last week. Maybe everyone's still tired. Does this seem unexpected? A little bit. <laughs> okay. So I guess my question is, if I run the tape forward, will they continue to look the same the whole time? Definitely and it turns not. out, yeah, the answer to that is no. The left panels show the early time for diseases that have three different R naughts and then look exactly the same. There's the data. Now I put it on a semi-log plot. You'll see that it goes up on semi-log because it's growing exponentially. But what you can also see is that these three diseases, R naught 1.52, 2.5, differ in the peak, how many people are infected when the disease is at its peak, and the size, the total number of people infected, which in some ways is not the area under this curve because these are not unique, this is prevalence, but it has to do with the accumulated number of infections and is related to this peak in duration. So let me label these three things. One's the speed, one is the strength, and one is the size. It turns out that you can get the same observed speed given very different strengths. So if we knew what was going on and going back to the question of what do we do with an emerging disease and we knew something about this strength, then we could predict the speed. And what we would need to know is something about the generation interval, the timing. Because if they have different timings, they could all end up having the same speed. But what we often see is this, we have this data, we see a speed how quickly cases are doubling, right? Which is what people saw in early 2020. And then we want to infer the strength. But unless something we know something about time, we have an identifiability problem where it's not possible in the absence of more information to disentangle this and uniquely specify the strength. And the reason why we care about the strength is because there is a relationship theoretically between size and strength. The more people that a typical infectious individual is going to infect, the larger we think the disease outbreak is going to get and the more burden, severity, and otherwise there's going to be on the population. So the individuals are often worried about this. Modelers are often worried about this because we care about that. Okay. Yes, question? Um, I, I had a quick question. 
if we keep increasing or not, is it possible that the total amount of days uh, of infection decreases if we have a uh, higher strength? Is it possible to decrease the amount? It depends. I have this other free parameter here in a moment, which, which if I go back here a second, you can see that the strength is the product of beta times TI, right? So if I were to increase, get this higher, right? by having beta go up really high and TI go down, right? I can make things go really fast. What I've done in this particular toy example is because this product is going up, what I have to do if I want the, our, the speed to be the same as beta minus gamma, while increasing, I also have to change the generation interval. So there's nothing to say that something that's really strong could go up, up and down really fast, but in this case, I've done it in such a way that it would only keep going to the right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, one so more question when you, here. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, my question is, if all our zeros cause the the speed to be the same, I would like to know what determines the angle in which the curve increases? Right, so the angle I think you're referring to is the exponential rate of spread. Yes, yes. In this example, it's all the same. And I'll tell you in a moment, when we see one of these observed data, we want to figure out what the strength is. In order to do that, we need to know something about the average period in which an individual infects someone else. So in a theoretical model, which you'll actually build in these, in part one of the laboratories, you'll get to play with these things and realize that depending on how you change beta and T, you can independently modulate both R0 and speed. Okay, so you'll get a chance to play with those two ideas. Okay? Okay, thank you. Let me just go and, and make it a little bit more clear, but here's this tentative conclusion that just because a disease has a higher or not doesn't mean it's gonna go faster, right? I just showed you it's going exactly the same speed given the fact that even though we have, despite the fact that we have different values of R naught, yet the final size and the long-term outbreak will be different. So there is something different. Let me try to explain this idea a little bit more in detail. Here are two epidemic curves, one with shorter generation intervals. In other words, typically the time between an infector and infected individual is shorter versus longer. But if we have the same weekly incidence of new cases going up exponentially, if we know the intervals are shorter, that means that there must have been more generations of people who've been infected, recovered, and infected others to create the same curve. And per generation, the reproduction number must be smaller. Whereas if the generation intervals are longer, we have fewer generations and each generation must infect more people. So if I condition upon an observed data set, the smaller generation interval, the lower an R0, and the higher generation interval, the higher the R0. And you can see that even more in this picture, right? Here we have one, two, three, four generations get the same number of infected individuals at a certain time. The other one, I have two generations and therefore per generation on the right, we must infect more individuals, okay? This gives you a nice intuition for how you go between speed and spread. And often we observe speed and want to infer strength, uh, speed and strength, we, we see speed and infer strength and the generation interval is the thing that becomes the intermediary. Now it turns out, and again, it's this question of what are models useful for that I think was raised by one of the questioners early. I'm gonna try to make the claim that it's useful for many things and not just forecasting. I, maybe I wanna know something about spread early on, but what I observe is the speed. There were early estimates, including some of which were done with my colleague Sangwoo Park and Jonathan Dushoff, in which we try to do the, exactly these kind of calculations. And in early 2020, there was this headline 
the COVID-19 disease may be twice as contagious as we thought. We had already made estimates and we already knew about this relationship. So what I figured was happening is that it was the same data, but people thought that the disease was spreading slower at the person to person level. And if those intervals go longer, then the r naughts go up. Here is a plot of an example of this kind of work where you have the growth rate per day. So that's that sort of speed that I've been talking about. And you, if you do one over it, it's really log two over it, but you get the idea, you get approximately a doubling time. So log two over this, so we're talking about three or four days, four or five days, five or six days of a doubling of cases. So let's say we observe a speed. So we're on the x-axis and we want to infer the strength, which is the y-axis. You see that their intervals, serial rather than generation, that's a different topic, to go from low to high. And as they make different assumptions, r naught goes from low to high. And in fact, doubles because of the nonlinearities here. It goes up more rapidly. And this is the reason why this particular group ended up making predictions of r naught of 5.7 which was about twice what we and others had done because they made assumptions that somehow the intervals were longer. So they went from the observed to the strength, making a different assumption and got a different answer. We had done this early on. And you can see this was received even by mid-Feb. We had our first estimates out where we thought the r naught was approximately three. But depending on what assumptions you make, there was a lot of uncertainty. And really the, these uncertainties had were driving some of the different answers. Okay, that's the initial part of the outbreak. But now I wanna ask a different question. What's going on up here? What is it that leads to this peak in conventional models? At the very start of this lecture, I talked about Farr's law, which somehow through means unknown, Non-mechanistically, it goes down. The IHME and cubic model, they're random fits that anytime there's an inflection, it goes down and they can be turn out to be terribly wrong, like you saw both for COVID and HIV AIDS. So what is it that's supposed to lead to the end of epidemics in conventional models? Okay, what is it that causes this peak and then a decline? So let me go back and assume that r naught is about three. In which case, if we have an infectious individual in a pool of all susceptible individuals, there are many potentially infectious contacts and some fraction lead to new infections. If everyone is susceptible, in this case, this disease would lead to three new infections. And that's what we mean by R naught of three. Those S's would become I's and it would continue. That's at the start. Now imagine later on, in which two thirds of the individuals in this community have already been infected and recovered. In which case, if we have an infectious individual, then what you can see here is that they have these same three contacts, but two out of three of them are wasted from the disease's point of view. They don't lead to a new infection. In fact, only one leads to a new infection. This is called herd immunity. And here the effective reproduction number becomes one because one case leads to just one new case on average. But after that, the next one will lead to even fewer cases because now that private, previously infectious individual has recovered. And so the rate of new cases, the incidence will start to decrease. This is what leads to a peak in cases, a depletion of susceptibles, and the rapid decline of new cases and for disease that have fatalities, fatalities. I have now given you a summary of what would happen starting from a disease that has everyone susceptible, this is the infectious fraction with different strengths, R0 of 1.2, 1.62, 2.4, and 2.8. Here, time is implicit 
So I start here and I'm showing you a phase diagram between S and I, in which you start here. And if the disease is very strong, susceptibles are to being depleted. The infectious fraction reaches some peak and then goes down. And by the end, we have no more infectious individuals. And there's about 10% here, a little bit less than 10% of individuals who have never been infected in this epidemic. For R0 of 1.2, this ends with more like 70% of individuals never having been infected. This gray area over here is the area in which these dynamics cannot go because S plus I must always be less than one, right? So this is the line I equals one minus S. So the dynamics can never go into the upper right. So what you can see here is that there's this relationship between the strength or not and these peak size in two senses. One the peak level of infectious individuals, and also the size of epidemic, which goes monotonically upwards and downwards in terms of those who haven't been infected as we increase the strength. Okay. So this is a strength size relationship without being mathematical, just giving you the intuition. If we were to do this for all the values of R0 in these simple cases, here, what I'm showing you are two things. This herd infection, herd immunity threshold, which is this dash line, which I just showed you at which the R effective becomes one. So for three, it becomes two thirds, four it becomes three quarters, and so on. Because at that level, we have just the replacement level of infections. But the final size of the epidemic is in the solid line. And what I want you to see is that there's this epidemic size exceeds that of the herd immunity threshold. So another confusing element of COVID was that people talked about the herd immunity threshold. And I, I will skip one set of slides. There was a particular Brazilian group that suggested the herd immunity threshold was very low. And I won't go into all the reasons why there, there are some problems with that. But even if we reach herd immunity, once the disease is already spreading, the disease doesn't stop. It's just at a level of replacement so that there are still substantial number of potentially new cases. This is called epidemic overshoot, and it can be quite substantial, right? On the order of, 25, 30%. Okay. So this final size is going up with R0, even if the speed can look the same at the beginning. And again, these are both linked in both senses to the epidemic strength. There's an elegant mathematics here, but it turns out that these final size relationships only hold by neglecting some real world factors. And in the Second stage of, of the talk today, maybe I'll go into how you actually derive some of these, but for now, um, let me go into some of the reasons and watch these simple models. They get the spirit of how COVID-19 might unfold. They need to be modified in light of its particular features and also by thinking more about behavior. All right, so that was part one. Can I make a question? Excuse yes, me. you may. Good time for questions. Hi, good morning, Joshua. Um, I would like to know if uh, epidemic outbreak size that you're defining is the maximum number of uh, infected individuals. Is that it? The yes. Just the, okay, just to be clear. Because size is not the total cumulative number of infected people. It's just the number, the maximum one, right? So the here I'm using size as being the cumulative number of infections. Oh, cumulative. So, okay. Yeah, in right. this case, in this plot. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. And so it looks like it's going to one, but it's not. There's always a tiny bit in these models in which it's there are some individuals who've never been infected. They'll get smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. That's different than the prevalence, which are the number of people infected at any given time, right? Prevalence. The, the, okay. Right. And even the instance, which is the number of new infections typically set over a course of a week. Okay, got it. Thank you. So if I were to do here, this would be the prevalence because at this point you can see that the maximum prevalence goes up with R0 because that's the number of infectious individuals at any particular time. But here, once they recover, I still count them in the outbreak size 
is the cumulative number of people who have been infected, which I count in some sense by I plus R, but at the end, it's only R, the recovered individuals. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, Any I other also, questions? Sorry, yeah. I also have a question. I just didn't understand when you were when you were explaining that plot what you meant by um, the herd immunity threshold being the point of replacement. Is that what I heard? Yes. Let me go back to this picture. Once I have a certain number of individuals who are already recovered, then this infectious individual, instead of infecting three new people, just infects one individual. So I have per infectious individual, they recover and lead to just the same number of infectious individuals. So that's what I mean by replacement. Oh, okay. And because it's the same, then my infectious, my prevalence curve will reach a plateau. But soon even those individuals like this person will have a less than one on average number of new infections and on average then the cases will start to go down. That's what I mean. Okay, thank you. And I'll define it mathematically in the second part, uh, but I'm trying to give you all the good intuition here for how these things work. Okay? Any other questions before I go to the second part? Okay, I'm not hearing any. So let me go into why I think it's COVID-19 has been so difficult to predict and control. So it turns out that there are a few things that, that made COVID very hard, but one of which we knew about before, and one of which was in fact a new feature for SARS, not to say a new feature for all disease, but a new feature for SARS relative to SARS-1. But one of the things that we knew to be the case is that Individuals don't contact everyone else, not even for airborne respiratory diseases. There are networks of people that you're more likely to interact with, and that's certainly true for sexually transmitted diseases or things like flu in which they're droplet-borne, and even for cases in which there's airborne transmission, because you're more likely to interact with people in your household, people on your commute, people at work or school. You can imagine that having this same idea and applying it to some kind of network. And it turns out that when this happens, because people don't interact with all the same number of people, certain individuals, whether because of who they interact with or when they interact with, and maybe they have a higher rate of spread, will lead to more cases on average than other individuals who aren't interacting with as many people. And this was shown in a very important paper by Jamie Lloyd Smith in 2005, almost 20 years ago, in which you look at the, in here, the number of secondary cases. So the number of cases caused by a primary case and the frequency of time it has this value. And in a typical SR-like model, you end up getting a geometric distribution you can imagine there might even be some ways in which we have something which has a bit of more of a tail, but this means that the chance of having a high number of cases is very low. Whereas in fact, what people see is this tail sitting out on the side, suggesting there can be super spreading events. And if there are super spreading events, and if I were to rank the proportion of infectious cases, meaning one person infected 30 people, they're ranked one, and the other 28, they're ranked two, and I would look at a fraction of the total population. If everyone infected the same number of individuals, if I rank the infectious cases against the proportion of transmission, then I would get this flat, straight line. And this is, in some sense, deviations from it are a measure of inequality or super spreading, heterogeneity. This is often used with 
wealth. And I think I can make the analogy to wealth if I look at the proportion of wealth in a population and rank individual based on how much wealth they had. If all of us had the same wealth, then we would have this straight line. If I would just rank the people, then they would accumulate wealth in a linear sense and we would get a straight line one-to-one -one relationship. Whereas if a small proportion of the population has a large proportion of the wealth, then it would go up very rapidly and there'd be a long tail on the other side. This also applies to disease transmission and notably SARS-1 had this feature in which a small proportion of individuals were responsible for a disproportionate fraction of transmission. That already says that things are going to be different than the standard SIR-like models. And that could be good or bad. Super spreading means that things could spread more rapidly, but maybe if the super spreaders, if they are super spreaders, and it doesn't have to do with the situations, then maybe those people will infect others very quickly, but they'll recover, and then the disease will go away. Right? So it could lead to faster speed, but maybe it will lead to rapid elimination. It turns out that yes, SARS-CoV-2, and we knew this very early, had uh, super spreading features. And you can see this in examples of these number of secondary cases in which there was this famous choir practice, there are social contacts, unfortunately, uh, some in Georgia had super spreading events related to funeral gatherings. So people would gather either to bury someone who died often of COVID or something else, and then there would be a large spreading event there. There were many examples that are not consistent with some exponential distribution of timing, which would lead to a very narrow tail, but in fact, COVID seemed to be fat tail. And this was one example of people making this case by aggregating these secondary uh, cases and showing that in fact, it had this large uh, fat tail. That's one feature. You can then turn this feature in some ways into a model. And there are ways to do it with networks, but another way is just to structure the population and imagine that individuals, as I showed you before, interacting with each other differently and so that certain groups maybe have a higher propensity to be infected or contact than others. So you might expect certain groups to have higher number of secondary cases. This is what more or less Britain et al. did early on. And this paper, although it was published in Science, going back to your question about high impact paper, it was published in Science in late 2020. But there were many models like this, including by Brazilian groups by our team here at Tech and others, this will happen to be one of the first that put a numerical idea out there. And what they did is structure a population. Here I've shown different groups. I've added an exposed class, but otherwise the same kind of model. I've used gray, pink, green, blue, yellow, and white to show that there are six different groups. This matrix says that these individuals are going to contact each other not uniformly, and also have different levels of interaction. So certain groups are going to interact more, and maybe this is an implicit age structure where people at schools are going to interact a lot, and as you get older, maybe a little bit less. The other feature of this matrix is it has off-diagonal terms, and although I haven't drawn a network diagram, you can imagine that within the yellow, there's a lot more interactions than between yellow and the other colors, and that applies for all the colors. So the peak value in any row or column is going to be on the diagonal. Okay. If you take this model and then ask, what fraction of the population has to be infected for us to reach herd immunity compared to the classic level, heterogeneity has the effect of decreasing the herd immunity level. Because once I interact locally, I deplete these individuals who may be more likely to infect, and I'm not jumping across to the other groups. So irrespective of the r not level, the point is that once you have heterogeneity, it could be that these predictions from the simple models are over predictions of final sizes, of herd immunity and final sizes. 
this itself became a big deal early on because it implied that maybe, in fact, these IHME-like models were going to be right, that maybe there was so much heterogeneity here that this disease would go away. These predictions of HD, of course, are for only a single introduction. Whereas if the disease kept, keeps being introduced again and again, you do not get this level of herd immunity because you could see yet another outbreak in different parts of a network or community. So that already goes to show you that there were differences very early on in what we thought might happen based on this notion of heterogeneity. And I want to try to explain a little bit about this notion of heterogeneity. And I guess, Flavia, I'm coming up to 815. I'm taking my time today, which I hope is okay, as I felt like I didn't want to rush through. Um, usually you like to have a Q&A section, right? How do you want to do it today, Flavia? Flavia's not here, um, ah, but we can ask I'll, the room. <laughs> okay. You have a hard stop at 8.30, uh, excuse me, 10.30 with, uh, with a coffee break. Is that right? That's right. Well, we have some questions now. If now is a good point to pause. Yep, yeah, that's fine. Go for it. Uh, could you go back to the contact matrix? Right? B yes. Uh, so this matrix is not symmetric. Uh, what does that mean? Yeah, the, the, the points here, I mean, again, the, the difference in this last little digit here, if I got rid of the digit, uh, this was their choice. It is nearly symmetric. So I'm not sure what to make of the fact that there's this, I can't remember really why there's a fourth decimal that's off or if they've done some strange averaging. It's nearly symmetric across the diagonal. It is not uniform along the diagonal because you can have a different activity level with different groups. It is possible that for various reasons, you could have individuals who are more likely based when they interact for a young person to infect an old person than vice versa. You can imagine something like that. But the fact that it's only differing on the fourth decimal place suggests to me, and I can't remember exactly why they had that slight asymmetry or there's just some numerical issue here that's showing up. So I, I wouldn't read too much into it. In fact, it, it looks like a numerical thing to me. Is that what you were noticing? Yes, yes. I can't recall why, but it's uh, now I find it unusual that it's the third or fourth decimal place. My major point here is that the diagonal can be very different and that the diagonal is the biggest number was the point I was trying to take away. And I think for the most part, you could think of it a first approximation as being mostly symmetric. Why it's not perfectly, I don't recall. Okay, thank you. Good catch. Uh, I have a question as well. Uh, is it possible to go back to the slides with the disease curves? Yes, this one. Uh, you did explain the concept of ter heterogeneity, and when you made the apology to wealth, I understood a bit, but I'm still n I still didn't understand properly when you adapted to diseases. I wanted to understand this graph better. Could you explain right. it again, please? So let's say I rank order the infectious cases so that the first individual infects 10% of the population. There are 10 individuals, okay? I would put 10% there. Then the second individual infects 9% of the population. There's only 10 individuals, so I'd be here with 10%. The second individual infects nine, so I'd be two at, let's say, Actually, no, let me do it differently. The first individual infects 30% of the population. The second individual infects 20% of the population. The third individual who infected someone infected 15% of the population. I'm over here and you can see I make a curve as I go across all individuals where I'm working my way on the proportion of infectious cases while looking at the relative to the final total transmission, 
and I generate these curves. That's what each one of those are. Is that clear? Should I make it do it again? What I just said. I think I understood better. So in if let me let me do it again. Okay. So here's zero. Let me imagine now if it's not a proportion, but I can just divide by n. Let's say there were ten people who had been in infectious cases, and I do one, two. I don't know why there's a loop there. Let's just make it go straight. Okay. You get the idea. Five, and I'm sorry, this pen is crazy. And here I'll do the proportion of transmission, one, 0 0.5, and here's zero. If the first individual, we start, now I'll use a different color. The first, uh, we all start zero. If the first individual infected 25% of the population, it's there. The second infected 45 Second infected 20% 20, 20 so now I'm at 45 the third 15 so now I'm at 60% the fourth 10 so now I'm at 70% right and I have five more and I kind of make my way across there I would get this kind of curve did you follow me yes I do whereas if everyone infected 10% of the population I would get that curve This is a notion of inequality in a disease sense, right? This gap. This happens when some people infect many more people than others. And if that happens, these kind of curves can look even more extreme. Well, no, it's giving me the wrong trying to draw like that. And this is what's going on here on this plot on the left. If you take this 10 divided by the number of infectious cases, I get an order from zero to one, and I hear I've also gotten zero to one. I see, I understand it now. It makes a lot more sense. Thank Good. you for drawing it for me. Yeah, uh, perfect. Just a second question, in, but what could cause this heterogeneity in the population in the case of COVID? Could be many different so factors. So the that things that can, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, I can. I, th I think the question was, what causes this heterogeneity? Y yes. When yeah. When talking about super spreading, I think it's important to talk about super spreading events and super spreaders. And both could be relevant. It could be that it's just circumstances. So, for example, there, at least in the U.S., there were a number of locations associated with super spread. These would, could often be like meatpacking facilities. There were a number of outbreaks there. Schools was another big one in terms of outbreaks. Religious gatherings or, or, and or where there was singing involved was another one. And so you could ask about the meatpacking examples. One, is there something about meatpackers? Are like they breathing out just a lot more uh, infectious virus, or are they in a place with very bad ventilation, working in cramped conditions in a cold, um, often low humidity environment, which just allows particles to stay in the air for a lot longer. In my view, this has to do with the conditions. It's not that those individuals were any kind of worse in behavior. They could have done all the right things, but been in a circumstance in which just the circumstances led to more transmission. It could also be that certain individuals are more likely to infect others because they just had higher numbers of infectious virus in their lungs, whether they were asymptomatic or symptomatic, and that led to more infections. So for SARS-CoV-2, I think both of those things operate. There were differences in terms of transmissible virus. You saw this with something called the CT value, which is basically how many cycles essentially in a PCR before you detect there has to be a case and the lower value means you didn't have to do the cycles as often to detect virus and people varied in their CT values. But it's also a question of context. For other diseases like sexually transmitted diseases has a lot to do with behavior and number of sexual partners. So in that case, there's going to be a relationship between behavior, very strong relationship between behavior and these super spreading like events. The other part of it has to do with 
cryptic transmission, people who are not aware that they're infected, and I'll get to that eventually in my talk today. Okay, thank you very much. Good. Other questions? Okay, if not, let's see where I was. Yeah, I may or may not get to the end of, maybe I'll try to get to the end of part two. We have one more. Is there another? Yep. Oh, another question. Okay. Yeah, it's, <laughs> um, it's just a quick question. It's a, a little bit about something you went a little bit ago. But is the generation time, it's not comprised in the um, I over T, right? It is something else that you have to know, like, probably mm -hmm. empirically, right? Uh, that's something that when we build models, we, uh, we are making an assumption about the generation interval, its mean and its distribution. Yes. So if, so if I have something like I dot is some force of transmission, so I'll just put it force of transmission, minus gamma I, this gamma is a recovery rate. Yes. Because it's a single factor, then if I were to look at time since infected, zero, and I look at the probability of being in, of, of, let's see, what should I do here? Probability of being infected after time t. I would get an exponential distribution that would go to zero, like e to the minus gamma t. Yes. So this gamma actually defines a distribution whose mean uh, is one over gamma. So that t sub i, the recovery rate, the recovery time is literally the mean of this distribution, one over gamma. Okay, and that's what you're considering the 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 the, the mean rate. infectious period is the mean of this generation. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. I'm I'm doing a lot that's implicit. I figured that you had already done some of the SIR stuff, and I had reserved the math for the second part. But I wanted to get the highlights because sometimes the relevance of this stuff is lost. So I'm trying to do it in context. We'll we'll see how it's going. Well, you'll tell me. Are there other questions? I think okay. that's all for now, yeah. So let me then, I have just a few minutes left and then we'll, we'll take a break. But let me just try to explain this heterogeneity idea. Like why is it that heterogeneity can lead to a lower herd immunity threshold and this is more technical. I may get into the second half. If not, you can find it all in this Rose et al. paper that I'm part of that we released early in 2020 and eventually got published in 2021. Now I'm going to do something different than almost all SIR models. I'm not going to add another E class or some other structured class. I'm going to assume that the entire population is characterized by some susceptibility epsilon. Okay. And therefore, instead of having just one box, which I call S, I have a bunch of tiny little boxes, which I call little S of epsilon, which are the essentially S of epsilon D epsilon. It's a continuous distribution would be the number of individuals whose susceptibility is between epsilon epsilon plus D epsilon. So it's a distribution. So it's the number of individuals who have that level of susceptibility. And then those individuals become infected based on this beta SI, as we've done before, but I'm going to modulate their beta by this level epsilon. So in other words, if epsilon is zero, those people are just not interacting. They're not going to be infected. One is the average. So if it's one, they're going to be infected just like the classic SIR model, like beta SI. But if epsilon is a Above one, they're more likely because they're out interacting more, they have more contacts, or they're not taking precautions, or they just have a, a health state that makes them more likely to be infected given a contact. 
for example. And therefore, if that's this model, we can write the change of the infection with respect to time as the integral of all of these infections moving into the infectious class, and then the recovery is the same. You can imagine now that we've made a very simple distribution of the population where we have some exponential distribution. So some individuals aren't likely to be infected and some are more likely. And the mean is going to be one. Does everyone understand what I'm trying to get at there? And this is going to be the last concept before we take a break. Then the question becomes, who is the most likely individual to be infected next? What level of susceptibility should they have? Does everyone understand that question? Can I get some nods that everyone understands that question? I know it's late. There's a question in the back I'll get to in a second. So we have a distribution of susceptibility, and I want to know who, what level of susceptibility corresponds to the next person to be infected. It turns out that the mean susceptibility of the next person, in this case, is twice that of the mean. Why? Because you can imagine these people, there's a lot of people who have nearly zero susceptibility. They're not going to be infected. There are very few people who have high, but they're much more likely to be infected. So we have a distribution that's this. We have the probability distribution to be infected like this. But my probability of being infected goes up like that, which means that the product of those is some shape like that, which is what you see here. And this mean is to the right of one. What does this all imply? You're probably thinking I've gone insane here. What this means, though, is that once we have heterogeneity, and this is why all these heterogeneous models imply a lower herd immunity threshold, we get two things going on. We deplete the number of people who are susceptible, but we change the susceptibility of the people who are left because we're disproportionately pulling people off of the right side of the distribution, moving the mean to the left. Because if I always am choosing from the right on average, I must move the mean to the left. And what this means is that if we start with an initial curve of infected, and we expect an SIR-like model, what we see is that the population density, let me hide this control, starts from here, some initial distribution, and it gets sculpted. So we have fewer and fewer people who are infected, even as we deplete the people who could be infected. It turns out you actually change the nonlinearity of the model, which I find incredible. It says that the force of infection is no longer proportional to S, but S squared in one case, or it could be S to any exponent greater than one, which means that the total size of the epidemic is going to go down. And that's just the last takeaway I want to have at this point, which is that if you think about heterogeneity, you actually get sculpting, you change nonlinearity, and it changes all sorts of things. And that's the first thing I think that we learned very rapidly at SARS-CoV-2, that this heterogeneity was essential. And it meant that our final size predictions were almost certainly going to be off. But there's another feature that I think we need to talk about, which I'll talk about after we come back for the break. So let me stop sharing. We're at 8.30 here and 10.30 there. And I need a coffee. You probably need a coffee. So why don't we break and come back in 30 minutes? Sound good? Sounds good. Get caffeinated. I'll take questions. Yeah, I'll see you back in 30. I'm going to leave the, maybe I'll leave the meeting on, but I'll just, are you leaving it on, Stephen? How does it work? It doesn't matter. I, I will turn off my camera.